Hello and welcome to week five of oral communication. This week we're going to do something slightly different from what I've done in previous weeks. This week we're going to look at an analysis of a prepared speech, or a couple of speeches in fact. We're doing a, comparis a comparative analysis of two speeches, uh, a victory speech by President Trump when he won the US election in 2016, and a victory spe speech by Barack Obama when he won the US election in 2008. So in past weeks, the lectures have contained theory, theory being ideas that have been espoused and supported by evidence, either from a particular analysis or an argument that's been drawn from a series of other works. We've also um, had parts of lectures which have included application. So we've taken a theory and looked at how it's applied or what emerges um, out of that theory in terms of how it can be applied to particular things that we're doing. Today, um, I want to do, as I said, something different, which is a particular analysis. I'm not going to go into the theory that I'm using in order to break down the speech because it, it's not really relevant here. And um, of course there are going to be elements of application because the, the value of today's lecture is in your own application of creating um, speeches and presentations as they uh, come up in your work, but um, in week 10 there is an option to do an occasion speech. That's not my terminology, but that's um, what I'm calling it, or a TED talk. And of course, I hope this kind of analysis is also relevant uh, generally to you as you uh, continue to do this kind of work in communication and elsewhere. Um, one last thing before I move on, I want to plug again um, a really useful resource from Bernadine Innes Medford, uh, which is included in week four. If you haven't listened to that yet, if you haven't heard her advice about presenting and presentation, uh, she's a theatre arts teacher and has a lot of useful points in that resource. And there's a Q&A with it. Um, in which uh, her and I exchange some ideas and it's as a PDF. Um, look out as well um, for a lecture coming up in week seven. I'm just plugging it now and that's going to be by Ms. Cleghorn. We are going to have a lecture on storytelling and how that can be used in oral presentation and we're going to be leaning on symbolic convergence theory as part of the information surrounding the use of stories. So that's um, my brief introduction to this particular lecture and um, I'm looking forward to um, sharing some of my insights into how speeches are constructed by doing this particular kind of analysis. So here's a more fulsome title for what we're doing today. As I already mentioned, um, this particular kind of analysis is of an occasion speech, and in this case it's a political victory speech. It has in it some very specific dimensions that will not apply to any other kind of occasion, but nonetheless it's so rich in information and um, can provide us with so many useful details that I just felt this was a good way to go for us. Um, just by way of giving you some background into my own kind of uh, writing in this area, I've actually um, spent quite some time analysing texts uh, for my own research, so I find this very interesting and um, illuminating in terms of uh, a presentation of ideas and issues around representation and how communication works but separate and apart from that excuse me um i was minister martin joseph's uh, communication specialist and speechwriter when he was very briefly 
Environment Minister. And at that point, he was Minister of Environment and Public Utilities. And um, I had occasion to write numerous speeches for him um, on various aspects of the Trinidad and Tobago environment and the work that he was doing in the politics surrounding that. Um, all right, so this particular speech, this victory speech, is a rousing speech. It's meant to draw together a crowd. Um, it has elements of the motivational speech, which um, I mentioned briefly in week four. And um, it presents the world as a binary. And, you know, if you're with the victor, you're going to be happy. If you're not, you're hoping the speaker is going to indicate ways in which, in this case, he is accommodating. So um, there's something else I need to say at the outset, and that is for this lecture, we're not going to be thinking about the politics. I think it's inevitable that it kind of comes up, it slips in. Um, and neither are we going to be thinking so much about the person himself, but rather the personality. Uh, I want us to think of these two individuals as the political actors they are performing you know, if you like, political theatre. I am actually including in the citations a political analysis of both speeches done at various times by different people. And I've chosen not to read it until the end because I'm not so much interested in the politics. I'm really interested in the way the speech uh, itself works. So, um, you know, I'm not really concerned so much with the outcome of what they're saying, but rather why they're saying it and how it works or how it might work in the ways that you know speeches do um, another thing to say is if you were ever in any doubt that these men are great orators then <clears throat> i think this kind of analysis highlights how good they are they manage to bring together massive complex politically charged audiences behind them um, with incredible communication sophistication. But what this lecture will also touch on is how clear it is that these men are constructs and they are working with data-driven directives. They are stage managed by teams of you know, highly skilled individuals. They are great orators themselves, but there is a whole team behind them. And much of what happens in a speech is not by mistake. I think there can sometimes be some kind of magic when a speaker does something, maybe even off the cuff, but it could also be scripted. But, um, you know, a lot of this that goes into a speech and a lot of what happens when these speeches are delivered has been well choreographed and well thought out. Um, and so this, very, this lecture is very much about the power of a complex communication tool the political victory speech. So this is my method, if you like, for the particular lecture. I'm going to be going through these steps. And if you look at two, three, and four, these are the questions I'm going to be asking of the text that we're looking at. Um, I'm going to include the audio clips because there are elements of the delivery rather than just the text alone, which I think are pertinent and come out. Um, so my methodology, as in why am I doing it this way, is because I want us to develop an increasingly deep understanding of the material uh, and think about the emotion that's conveyed, the content of the speech, and then um, some of the particular language communication, discourse elements that are at work to produce it. And then uh, with each section of the speech that I'm going to be looking at, I'm going to give you some points of application. So um, you may remember when we looked at the Ajay Lovey TED Talk, we considered elements of structure, such as repetition and narrative, you know, where things were, were placed in the particular presentation she was doing. We considered techniques used across her presentation, such as humour and the different ways she used humour, 
the fact that it was motivational and so worked in a certain kind of way, setting up ideas as having no good alternative. This speech is different in many ways from that, even though I say it contains elements of the motivational speech. And so it's important that we don't get fixated on there just being one way to construct a speech, because of course this speech is intended to do something in particular, and as you'll see by looking at the two speakers, they actually do it in different ways. However, there is um, something that this speech must do, which is what Lovey did with her presentation, and that is one, hold the audience attention, uh, two, as I said, it contains facets of the motivational speech because it is seeking to empower an audience and um, while hers was about inspiring individuals to change, these are inspiring individuals to feel part of change to come, whether they voted for the person and or the party or not. So for each of the speeches, um, we're going to listen to a sample that I'm calling their opening remarks. Um, it's just a clipped segment of the speech. First, we'll listen to Donald Trump, who gave his speech in 2016. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. Sorry to keep you waiting. Complicated business. Complicated. Thank you very much. I've just received a call from Secretary Clinton. She congratulated us, it's about us, on our victory. And I congratulated her and her family on a very, very hard fought campaign. I mean, she, she fought very hard. Hillary has worked very long and very hard over a long period of time, and we owe her a major debt of gratitude for her service to our country. I mean that very sincerely. Now it's time for America to bind the wounds of division, have to get together. To all Republicans and Democrats and independents across this nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people. It's time. I pledge to every citizen of our land that I will be president for all Americans, and this is so important to me. For those who have chosen not to support me in the past, of which there were a few people, I'm reaching out to you for your guidance and your help so that we can work together and unify our great country. Okay, so now let's uh, do the same with the Obama speech from 2008. Support for NPR comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Hello, Chicago. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy. Tonight is your answer. It's the answer told by lines that stretch around schools and churches. 
in numbers this nation has never seen, by people who waited three hours and four hours, many for the first time in their lives, because they believed that this time must be different, that their voices could be that different. It's the answer spoken by young and old, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, disabled, and not disabled. Americans who sent a message to the world that we have never been just a collection of individuals or a collection of red states and blue states. We are and always will be the United States of America. It's the answer that, that led those who've been told for so long by so many to be cynical and fearful and doubtful about what we can achieve to put their hands on the arc of history and bend it once more toward the hope of a better day. It's been a long time coming, but tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. So now let's take a stab at the analysis by looking at the mood and essentially I'm asking this question, what feeling uh, is the speaker trying to create? I actually found that um, both of them were doing the same thing in their opening remarks at least and so I've put this universal banner if you like across the two speeches. The idea that the tone was conciliatory, it was unifying, it was trying to bring the audiences together. Um, for me Trump strikes a very conversational tone. He actually does a good job I feel of making it feel unrehearsed. I suspect there were places where he was working from bullet points and obviously I could tell from the way it was um, being delivered. There were times where he was tripping over the words so you could tell that it was something he was reading. However, um, I think what may have happened if you look at the transcript because they intersperse it with, the transcript that is, is interspersed with bracketed audience claps or laughter, um, that this posting of the transcript was edited to fit the words that Trump actually used. The Obama speech, by contrast, actually feels quite lofty. It sounds written. Um, the ideas, the phrasing, the grammar, all feel intellectual and even poetic in places, and nobody can achieve that in a written speech that is striking a conversational tone. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get that kind of feeling. Um, for me, Trump comes across, or seeks to come across at least, as magnanimous by thanking Hillary. He refers to the nastiness of the political campaign, and he refers to us, the audience, in what has been achieved. Obama creates the us in a different way, and that is by talking about America. Um, but we also know he's talking, one supposes, about his success intersected with race and the political change of, of the moment. Um, neither speech you'll notice starts with a long list of welcomes, all protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Um, personally, as a journalist, I found there were many uh, press conferences I went to or many events I went to where you could probably skip the first five minutes because we have a habit of doing a long list of naming uh, of everyone in the audience, um, all of the people that need to be acknowledged at least, and you know, I have my doubts as to whether that's a good way into the into the speech. Um, but clearly, I think even without the um, benefit of hindsight, we can say that these two speeches were given in very different political moments.
So let's take a look at the themes, the key ideas that were being expressed. Um, Trump, in this opening segment, talks of the nature of pol politics. He refers to it as a fight, which is telling. Um, and we can say that the use of metaphor for concepts is a useful insight into a whole framing for the representation of ideas. Um, researchers talk of semantic depth as coming from using metaphor. And um, there will always be, in an analysis of representation, I think, a sliding scale of what an audience considers acceptable. You know, obviously from those listening to feel that they're poorly represented or represented in a way that they're not happy with, to ways in which the representation is maybe adequate. Um, but when we talk about uh, metaphors, the ones that I'm thinking of that you might be familiar with are things like War on Cancer. Um, we have a Trinidad one, Criminals are Cockroaches. And, um, you know, we can always say that what is implied will always be justified by some and opposed by others. But nonetheless, metaphor can be a useful way for adding this loftiness, this grandeur to an idea. Um, Trump also cites politics as the source of the fight and the space where people should now come together. He says Republicans, Democrats, independents. Um, this is all about the politics. Obama describes a scene of lines of people in everyday America of diverse people across politics coming out to support him. And I've used um, his quote, young and old, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, black, white, Latino, Native American. Um, did you notice as he was recounting those, um, those categories of people and uh, other parts of the speech, this kind of rising cadence that he had? Um, it was part of his presentational style that it felt like it was rousing and drawing people together and um, seeking to be all inclusive and I, and I or inclusive certainly of a certain uh, set of categories and I think he does that both through the content i.e. the themes and through what we could say are one of the elements one of the ways in which he approaches the speech um, stylistically which we'll come to in the next slide just now Now, let me um, start by talking about some elements of these uh, two speeches. The things that we might, I suppose, consider uh, are contained in this idea of persuasive devices, which are the manoeuvres that happen in language, communication and discourse that in fact um, kind of ref act as an umbrella in working across uh, the whole speech. So the first thing to say is that it's not by coincidence that these speeches contain lots of useful sound bites, these perfect phrases that can be clipped and analyzed as useful media for broadcast of the essence of the speech, if you like. I was listening to a media correspondent the other day talk about the Trump-Biden debate, and this was on BBC World Service, and um, it was a, an analyst from of, of US media from the US, and she said that the news cycle would analyse and clip the content, and that was how most Americans would receive it. So they probably wouldn't see the live debate, or even if they did, they would get a lot more of the analysis of it from the clips that were put on YouTube and used by the various broadcast media to analyse the content. Kind of what we're doing now with these speeches, but obviously for broadcast. Um, and she was saying that it's the close scrutiny of these clips that actually has more of an impact on someone's first impression of the two candidates. So uh, this is presented, of course, these sound bites with what Americans describe as the optics, the PR, you know, how it, how it looks. So the speech, while it's written, it is written for TV and YouTube and radio, or at least with those things in mind. 
and you know um, the fact is that these particular communication platforms work in different ways and appeals to certain appeal to certain kinds of audience and it's with the idea that uh, it is through these platforms that the information is going to be disseminated and so it's you know made in a way constructed in a way that is uh, going to get the approval of those and the audiences of those. Um, the other thing to say is that media creates an echo chamber, this space where people look for like voices and end up hearing content that's actually similar to uh, content they've already looked for. It is the way the algorithms work um, and in particular when you search for um, elements from these particular speeches. I looked up Bind the Wounds of Division, which was a uh, quote from the Trump speech. Now that phrase has very old origins, I'm going to talk about it just now, but what the um, Trump team would have done is had people who work on social media and they keep putting this kind of phrase into content in certain ways such that when you do a search, it becomes where you will find that uh, phrase. So I actually did a search for Bind the Wounds of Division because I recognised it as having some kind of uh, history to it. I could just tell from the way the um, phrase worked and uh, just, I guess, from my own um, feeling, really, that it had some reference. It, it, it stemmed from somewhere else. It wasn't a Trump original um, quote if you like but in fact many of the searches for it brought up the Trump speech um, I had to dig a little bit to, to find out some more but um, you know once you get familiar with the way search engines work you kind of know how to how to get around these things so obviously too both of these men have speech writers it's far too much to expect these men to write these work themselves fact check them practice the delivery you know, it is a team effort and um, that's something you would want to bear in mind when analysing text. Know that, you know, while Obama was really well known for actually going over his speeches and editing them, of course the first writing was by somebody else. He might put himself in it and he might even be interviewed by the speechwriter or speak to the speechwriter or team of speechwriters, in fact, as it was at one point, um, to you know, share some ideas, but eventually it would be drafted by them and edited by him. Who knows what happened in this particular case, but certainly there is a, uh, a team behind him. Um, also, and this is my last point with this slide, the speech needs to have and seeks to address diverse audiences, differentiated political affiliates who supported the movements represented by each of these uh, men and therefore the analysis of the speech also throws up kind of material that is um, partly directed at specific audiences and with you know different political franchises if you like they have different interests and they're perhaps interested in different issues and maybe they are more interested in the party than the individual you know so the idea is um, that in, of course audiences are diverse and we should bear that in mind when thinking about this kind of analysis. So let's now analyse the speech in terms of its elements at the discourse level, meaning that we're taking into account the text itself, the genre, meaning the idea that this is a victory speech, and the social acts that need um, to be considered. Social acts being things like the fact that it was written by a team, the fact that the uh, speech goes through a number of edits, that the speaker needs to come across as presidential, for example. So some of the stylistic choices. Well, as I said, I did look up um, this speech, Binding the Wounds, and I actually found it coming from Psalm 147.3 and it was um, 
originally used uh, in a speech by Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address. And I will put the link to to that kind of um, analysis. So even if you don't <clears throat> know that this is the case, and I didn't, you get the sense sometimes when you hear something or read something um, that it has a certain kind of ring to it. Uh, in this case, I felt it sounded slightly biblical. Um, and in this case, I was right. It felt like there was a certain bigness to it, a uh, certain majesty. I, I kind of almost felt like I'd heard it before somewhere. And um, certainly in the context of the speech, I figured it meant more than fixing a problem. And I believe that the choice of words like, um, well, binding sounds quite, quite archaic. So it's the idea of wrapping wounds, but wounds themselves feel, the, the word feels quite visceral. I mean, it refers to obviously something physical of the body. And I think in this case, Trump is acknowledging that politics cuts deeply into people's lives. And, you know, he was using that to uh, indicate the depth of feeling that people had um, about electing him. Interestingly for me was that he also uses humour in this speech quite early on. He makes a joke about the fact that he's disliked and I think he's actually constructing himself as this dislikable character because one element of his brand is to go against establishment. I mean, that's what differentiates him. And so it works quite usefully for him in doing that. Um, Obama, on the other hand, he uses we opposed to the I of Trump's speech. He talks about our um, our issues, he talks about people, he talks about Americans, and um, he uses this idea that we've never been a collective, we have always, and we have, and always will be the United States, um, and we'll all, and we'll be American. So he, rather than using the uh, kind of disgruntled character that Trump used, for example, disgruntled with the establishment, Obama referred to himself as, you know, being American. And I guess in part that was because of the um, Bertha claim that uh, Trump raised this idea that maybe Obama wasn't born in America. Of course, it was completely spurious, but this is how, you know, politics works, um, certainly America at the moment. So there's a way in which um, this leaning on history or leaning on uh, quotes from elsewhere is done by Obama as well. And he used this idea of the arc of history it has a certain kind of gravitas to it. I looked that one up and that actually comes from a speech by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, when you actually look at the analysis of that, you you know you you know it has historical significance um but it's a repurposing of a line from dr king the actual quote is the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice which according to the analysis that i read uh, was a spiritual statement um and not a political one and i will include that link somewhere i found it very interesting so um just to say that that actual analysis said that uh, Martin Luther King never intended it as claiming any kind of certitude, which is what you kind of get from um, Obama's use of it. Martin Luther King, Dr. King, understood that ideas sometimes took hold and they were bad ideas and that, um, you know, they had an ascendancy that was detestable and that bad people did prevail but it was repurposed, as I said, by Obama and used in this political context. So let's now look at how you might uh, use some of this information in your own speech writing. So I've put up these four ideas, which struck me from my analysis of the first part of this speech, these opening comments. Um, you can just pause this recording and uh, jot them down yourself if you find them interesting but just to say 
a couple of things. When you write your speech, I think you want to take it slowly and really think, if you can, about where your ideas are coming from. And if it feels relevant, make those ideas feel bigger if that serves your purpose. So the idea of using a metaphor or um, doing something intertextual by using a, uh, a quote, for example, or repurposing a quote, those kinds of things can be useful and they'll lend a certain kind of semantic depth or gravitas to your to your speech. Um, I, I think it's important not to rush to find ideas. I know you will be keen to you know, write a draft of a speech if, if that's what you're going to be doing and get it out of the way. But I would caution you against you know, trying to speed through it because in that way, I think your work can come across as thin. And the way to add depth to it is to write your draft or put down key ideas, then start to draft your actual speech and then put it aside for a while and go back to it and see, you know, when you read it, when you read it over, if it still has the same kind of resonance or if you need to get to something more precise or something bigger uh, and work, work through it like that. Let your ideas percolate for a while. You know, your focus as a writer should not be on the words first, but the ideas first. And I think that's really important. If you're just rushing to, you know, put down a word then I think you are maybe going about it the wrong way. That's just my uh, two cents on the matter. The other thing that I think is important, and we can infer this from the first part of the analysis, is to consider the fact that you're going to be presenting your speech and that the presentation, in a way, is a character too, or certainly you can think of yourself as a personality that... Um, the piece is uh, leaning on. So there's a personality to the speech itself and does it gel with you as a speaker? Uh, do those two things connect? And you can think about the personality of the, of the speech itself and your own personality and try and you know think about both of those things. The, the speech itself has some kind of character. Um, there needs to be this kind of congruence and I think, importantly, you need to give it uh, an intentionality. So if it's a serious speech, obviously you're not grinning through it. It needs to be clear to your audience that you are self-aware. I must say, in some of the how-to assignments, um, you know, I noticed people were maybe a little bit nervous about uh, the topic that they were delivering on. And the how-to speech required you to be an authority on something. That's why you're giving someone the advice. Um, so you can't really express a you know, serious opinion with a smirk or deliver something um, that requires you to be confident with a kind of querulousness in your voice. It just isn't going to fit. So I want you to think about that too. So what we're going to do now is move on to further sections of the speech. I'm just going to label them numerically and I'm dividing the individual speeches up into chunks that I think end in uh, useful places in terms of describing what has uh, just happened. Um, as a result of doing this it does mean that each speech and each section rather is not going to be of equal length but we're still going to continue to uh, consider them in terms of the Donald Trump speech first and then the Barack Obama speech. So here we go with Donald Trump continuing his speech. As I've said from the beginning, ours was not a campaign, but rather an incredible and great movement made up of millions of hardworking men and women who love their country and want a better, brighter future for themselves and for their family. It's a movement comprised of Americans from all races, religions, backgrounds, and beliefs who want and expect our government to serve the people and serve the people it will. Working together, 
We will begin the urgent task of rebuilding our nation and renewing the American dream. I've spent my entire life in business looking at the untapped potential in projects and in people all over the world. That is now what I want to do for our country. <laughs> tremendous potential. I've gotten to know our country so well. Tremendous potential. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Every single American will have the opportunity to realize his or her fullest potential. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. We are going to fix our inner cities and rebuild our highways, bridges, tunnels, airports, schools, hospitals. We're going to rebuild our infrastructure, which will become, by the way, second to none. And we will put millions of our people to work as we rebuild it. We will also finally take care of our great veterans. We've been so loyal, and I've gotten to know so many over this 18-month journey. The time I've spent with them during this campaign has been among my greatest honors. Veterans are incredible people. We will embark upon a project of national growth and renewal. I will harness the creative talents of our people, and we will call upon the best and brightest to leverage their tremendous talent for the benefit of all. It's going to happen. We have a great economic plan. We will double our growth and have the strongest economy anywhere in the world. At the same time, we will get along with all other nations willing to get along with us. We will be. We'll have great relationships. We expect to have great, great relationships. No dream is too big. No challenge is too great. Nothing we want for our future is beyond our reach. America will no longer settle for anything less than the best. Now let's do the same with a clip from the Barack Obama speech. A little bit earlier this evening, uh, I received an extraordinarily gracious call from Senator McCain. Senator McCain fought long and hard in this campaign. And he's fought even longer and harder for the country that he loves. He has endured sacrifices for America that most of us cannot begin to imagine. We are better off for the service rendered by this brave and selfless leader. I congratulate him. I congratulate Governor Palin for all that they've achieved. And I look forward to working with them to renew this nation's promise in the months ahead. I want to thank my partner in this journey, a man who campaigned from his heart and spoke for the men and women he grew up with on the streets of Scranton and rode with on the train home to Delaware. The Vice President-elect of the United States, Joe Biden. And I would not be standing here tonight without the unyielding support of my best friend for the last 16 years, the rock of our family, the love of my life, the nation's next First Lady, Michelle Obama. Sasha and Malia, I love you both more than you can imagine. And you have earned the new puppy that's coming with us to the White House. along with 
with the family that made me who I am. I miss them tonight. I know that my debt to them is beyond measure. To my sister Maya, my sister Alma, all my other brothers and sisters, thank you so much for all the support that you've given me. I am grateful to them. To my campaign manager, David Clough. The unsung hero of this campaign, who built the best, the best political campaign, I think, in the history of the United States of America. To my chief strategist, David Axelrod, who's been a partner with me every step of the way to the best campaign team ever assembled in the history of politics. You made this happen, and I am forever grateful for what you sacrificed to get it done. But above all, I will never forget who this victory truly belongs to. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. Okay, so let's do our analysis again in terms of mood, themes, and elements. So starting with the mood that's being created, um, I, I felt that Trump sought to strike an upbeat tone and he headed straight into outlining a vision for a country that is ready for growth, using its talents and being inward focused, but with plans for the people of America. We, we know from subsequent political analysis and as I said, for this analysis, I'm not really uh, using the political analysis that I'm going to post for fear that it'll send me down this road of thinking about the politics. But certainly Trump captured voters who felt isolated by the political elites in Washington and who were focused on um, issues around or focused on uh, things like globalization. And, you know, that's why he refers to um, people who are forgotten and says they'll be forgotten no longer. He refers to the hardworking business people um, and veterans. And this is how he seeks to include the audience in his speech. There are allusions to specific groups, broad c categories, but, you know, enough context um, for him to seek to be inclusive. Obama goes for structure that starts with thanks. And for his speech, it was all about collaboration, dedication and sacrifice, and the benefits that will follow for the electorate. Um, I noticed he also got very personal. I thought he you know, thanked his wife and children and includes personal anecdotes. It feels very much like he wants to connect as an individual. He's saying, I'm like you to the audience, um, you know, like a man with a dog. Um, both Trump and Obama do this. They give um, a thank you to the people who are their opposition. It's interesting that there is always this acknowledgement, I think, uh, at, th at this moment of the sacrifices one makes for public office. It's one of the rare times that they really peel back the curtain on the kind of celebrity that they have acquired. And you don't, you know, often see that um, when you watch all kinds of celebrity, if you like, athletes or actors, you know, you don't often hear them talking about their craft. Um, you know, you just see the end point, the, the musicians whose music comes out, you don't see them in the studios and all the um, kind of back and forth and hair pulling that gets them to where they're at. So this is a bit of a Wizard of Oz moment, and I suppose it's metapolitics, if you like, um, and it serves to make these men human which, of course, is vital for them. I found it really interesting thematically that although both men referred to the difficulty of poli politics and the sacrifices, they also referred to the fact that their moments were 
um, historic and that the victory was more than just about the minutiae of the politics but was part of a bigger movement and a bigger moment. Now because of the way politics is in the in the US, big issue-led movements and reconstruction of the personalities, I felt that these men were seeking to cast themselves uh, in this way and create this idea of their particular vision for the future. Um, I think that can be true of UK politics too, recently with this um, Brexit issue dividing, dividing people and in some way causing rifts within parties. And, you know, here some of the issues, of course, get, you know, subsumed into political currents. And um, Obama actually talked in the opening about the power of democracy and you know, we've never been a collection of red states and blue states. All the groups that exercised their franchise came together. Trump here sta states outright that his was not a campaign but a movement. He does what Obama did in labelling groups of people, but at a more macro level. Um, it's interesting for me that he's more tabloidy in the propositions and less granular. He's speaking to a crowd, um, I would venture, that wants the big, less nuanced picture. Tabloids tell you what to think in some ways. And this is, you know, setting out the simple binaries of life. Uh, his vision then is about renewing the American dream, a highly motivated intertextual concept, um, because um, that has a particular historic um, resonance. And he talks about using American talent, honoring veterans, um, whom I understand have been treated disgracefully. And uh, many politicians have promised better. And it's a kind of, well, maybe you know better than I, but um, it's a kind of wait and see whether he delivers on that promise. Obama, in being, you know, very personal in the opening of his speech, personal in terms of revealing of family uh, stories and talking about um, his wife, he thanks McCain, his political team, um, his daughters, the family, and then tells the American people that the victory is theirs. Now, I've put up this um, quote, which I think is a moment of incredible openness. He talks about Michelle Obama, the, uh, well, she was the first lady, of course, um, and um, he refers to her as the love of his life and that's a massive endorsement of course but it's a personal moment and um, a moment of vulnerability and you know talking about the new puppy and his late grandmother and his uh, sisters all of that made him very human and um, you know clearly that was something that he wanted to go for. Now it's very clear that these two men have different styles and very particular styles. And um, one of Trump's is that he talks in superlatives. Everything is the biggest and the best. He talks about people and their fullest potential, infrastructure that will be second to none. He talks about the best and brightest people, the strongest economy anywhere in the world. Um, it's almost you know, comical really how everything is the biggest and the brightest and most stupendous to the point where, for me at least, the words feel quite meaningless. However, the details may well be true, and since here we're focused on presentation and not the politics, I, you know, I do get the impression that there is a lot for America to celebrate in terms of uh, its economic standing and, um, you know, quality of living in certain in certain aspects. But certainly, it's quite possible that this is an appealing message to his particular audience. Um, in terms of the pronouns, Trump started very much talking about I. He introduces we here, and so he moves from, you know, first person singular to first person plural. And here we start to see his idea of, you know, build, we will build roads and we will take care of our veterans. He could just as easily have said, I will take care of our veterans. So, you know, my question is, why didn't he do that? And I think uh, 
you know, while his speech showcases him as the leader providing a, a vision, it has to acknowledge voters and seeks to justify people having made a good choice. You know, he wants the goodwill, he wants to be liked as a provider and as someone who can set the priorities. So the writing, of course, is a very conscious effort. The writing of any speech is a conscious effort. And in multiple drafts of the speech, I would have loved to have seen the edits and seen what happened over time. Um, because if you compare this kind of speech with something extemporaneous, I think, you know, the extemporaneous speech, the unprepared one, maybe reveals our unconscious bias. But when we speak from a script, we reveal our conscious bias. It's what we always wanted to be clear. It's what we wanted to represent. It is our agenda. So go back and listen to where Trump actually puts emphasis in his spoken phrasing. And uh, when I did it, I thought it might be on the we, um, the we and us and our. But uh, actually, I found that the propositions that related to time seem to be really important. It's, that's what's called temp temporal deixis, here and now and finally. And of course, the superlatives, that's very clear and very evident in his presentational style. Remember, sometimes when we're talking about, you know, use of pronouns, um, it's not just the clear distinction of moving from I to we. Sometimes because of the genre of a speech requiring variety, he may have sometimes used I or the speechwriter may have put in I and sometimes use we. If you say I, I, I all the time, it sounds very self-centered. And if you sound we, we, we referring to all of us, it doesn't apply any of the focus to oneself. And we know uh, from various kinds of analysis on news and elsewhere that, you know, Trump likes to make sure he's, um, if not the centre of attention, certainly gets some of the attention. And um, also stylistically, he uses a lot of reinforcement, tremendous potential, he says, um, and things like that. And these phrases are affirmative and in the future tense, these are things that are going to happen. By contrast, Obama is still very much in the present tense. He's offering thanks and you, you know, would have to do that in the present tense. And as a stylistic choice, I think he sounds humble, opposed to bragging. And of course, um, you know, in saying I, w I wish to thank X and Y, the focus is very much on himself, but uh, it is to highlight and acknowledge the collaboration and team effort. If you read the transcript, as you as you listen, you'll notice there are occasions where he actually breaks from it. Um, at one point, he mentions his two sisters, for example, but that's not in the scripted speech. So in this way, he uses the speech as a guide, but he's able to speak off the cuff. He's not going to trip himself up in this speech. You know, he's not saying anything of material value to the nation, really. He's not worried about being fact-checked and found to be wrong because he's talking about his own family. And, you know, if you're going to introduce something that's unscripted, it's good to go with a story that, you know, is kind of uncontroversial if you're worried about, um, you know, saying something out of place. And also uh, you should note that, you know, he's an experienced lawyer by profession. He was a lecturer of law for 12 years at the University of Chicago teaching constitution and race theory. Um, by the way, you should check out the first line of an article that I'm including about him and you'll see another point that's mentioned there that is relevant to us in this course. Um, by contrast, Obama's uh, sentences are really quite complex. He begins with descriptors, which are titles, so things like to my campaign manager, and then the name, to my chief strategist, and the roles and, entitle, and titles are important. He talks about um, Sasha and, um, and Malia. He says, I love you so uh, both so much. Um, and the beginning of a phrase, beginning of a sentence is called an emphatic position. And he uses their names at the beginning and he uses the uh, titles of his um, staff, campaign manager, chief strategist in those emphatic positions to highlight the details and then follow with the idea, not the, not the other way around. Um, just to be clear, 
This is not to say Trump's phrasing doesn't have complexity in it, because of course it does. The, the proposition here on the slide, nothing we want for our future is beyond our reach. It could have been said in a simpler way, um, but interestingly, it's written in the negative, nothing beyond our reach to highlight where we're starting out, perhaps, to say everything we want is within our grasp. But he didn't say it that way. Um, this phrasing, of course, puts nothing in the emphatic position and really, I think, is a political um, choice in that it's seeking to highlight the deficit, the starting with nothing, you know, the failing of the previous administration and that kind of thing. OK, so once again, let's look at how we can utilise what we've learned about the way this uh, speech was, these speeches were constructed and see how we can uh, bring these techniques to our own writing. So again, I've uh, constructed four points that I think might be useful for you to consider when producing a speech. Um, but I just want to say something about the idea of placing ideas in certain places uh, in your work. I have found that when you're constructing a speech, um, if you write it in a way, physically write it and type it in a way where you have single ideas or single sentences written the way you might write journalism so you just write everything on a as a separate sentence and then put a space and put your next sentence i mean you could have a you know a journalistic paragraph if you like that has two sentences in it but typically it's not more than that you can actually use this as a way to shuffle through your ideas and move them around uh, if it feels like the wrong place for them of course because you know no single journalistic paragraph is going to be disconnected from you know the previous one or the one after uh, you may need to take a bunch of paragraphs with you and move ideas that way or you could use crossheads in your speech to uh, articulate where your themes are and then move things around um, one of the things that I noticed and this is um, probably where we'll end this uh, particular lecture I had hoped to get through more of the speech, but um, I see my hour is almost done. Um, one of the things I noticed is that Obama actually thanked Joe Biden uh, fairly early on in the speech. He, as I said, started with we, moved to the personal, but he kept his focus on collaboration. And that, thanks to Biden, came very quickly. Interestingly, uh, Trump's final words were, thank you to Mike Pence, thank you. Um, it was really striking to me. If you actually look up Trump giving his uh, speech, um, if you look it up on YouTube, you'll see the footage. It seems like a really awkward handshake at the end where he pulls Mike Pence towards him. Um, to me, it's clear that Trump doesn't really care for the man. Uh, he feels like the opposite of Trump to me, a technocrat, career politician, kind of behind the scenes sort of person. Uh, and that's just me saying this as an outside observer. Of course, I don't um follow american politics that closely but he almost feels invisible as a personality so this is where i'm going to leave it i do want to put up a resource for you on persuasive devices which i have in the have in the um, schedule as something that i want to cover because i think there is uh, something important to say about that but i'm going to um, put that up uh, on my learning rather than include it in this lecture uh, just to say I'm looking forward to seeing how your work develops um, it's important to to think of these lectures as cumulative the value of them and the points that we raise in them I think should be considered as things to jot down and basically we're looking at improving or increasing your your repertoire so that as you come to each successive assignment you bring in elements that you've covered and, and new elements that we're discussing and with this i thank you